thing to one and all and also a very fresh and warm good morning to all our guests who are with us from the states we at ICT welcome you all to the first ever masterclass of Vortex 9.0. A very hearty welcome to all of you. Before we start, uh, I would like to request our audience to set up for the session by joining us on Pigeon Hole. So Pigeon Hole website URL is in the chat box. You just have to enter the passcode and you will be all set. Now, why is this for? This is so that you can type in your questions or also upload questions from other participants uh, of the meeting who have put their questions over there so that we will get to know what are your queries. And, you know, this is all an effort to make the session more interactive uh, for some, for audiences, and so that we can get the most from some. So please type in your questions there during the session, after the session, whenever you feel so. Thank you. Moving ahead, um, I would first like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor A.B. Pandit, sir, with her. Welcome, sir. Okay, I'm Gargi Yadav and I'm going to be your host for the evening. And firstly, thank you to all other audiences as well who are here to attend this event. Vortex is the annual tech fest of ICT Mumbai and it has a legacy of being India's largest campus. And of course, the most awaited one for all ICTians too. The first is one of its kind blend of quizzes, paper presentations, industry defined problems, technical games, and much other things. This year, we are back to amaze you all with the mind-blowing and eye-opening speakers for our flagship event, the Masterclass. There's this quote by Patrick Dixon, which I would like to quote here. The key to understanding the future is one word, and that is sustainability. And I think I haven't heard anything more true than this in a while. Who better could be our Masterclass speaker than him, who has been constantly working in the fields of sustainable engineering and contributing towards a better tomorrow for all of us. The world is full of diamonds and gems, and we have one of those here with us to build this event. I would wholeheartedly like to welcome and introduce to you all, Professor Bhavik Bakshi, our speaker for today's masterclass. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, moving ahead, I would like to take this as an opportunity to introduce sir to all of you. Sir has been immensely contributing to the fields of chemical engineering and sustainable development for years. His major professional interests lie around the fields of sustainability science and engineering, circular economy, process system engineering, complex and multi-scale systems, among others. Sir has completed his education with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in the year 1986 from UD City, formerly known UD City, now ICT. Post this, he went on to complete his master's in chemical engineering practice, followed by PhD in chemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Sir has a vast academic experience starting at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology itself. He has long been associated with the OU State University, starting from 1993 to present. That's a long time. He has worked as a professor of chemical engineering and to date continues to be a professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering and a professor of civil, environmental, and geodetic engineering at the Ohio State University. He has also worked as an advisor, professor, and visiting faculty at a number of Indian universities and institutes, including ICT. He has industrial experience of working with a number of organizations that include AWARE, General Electric Company, Dow Chemical Company, and the Indian Organic Chemicals name of you. He has immense contribution in the fields of scientific literature with 36 book chapters, three books, 143 journal articles, 54 proceedings publications, 153 invited presentations, and around 186 paper presentations to his name. The list just continues more and more. He is involved in a number of editorial boards and activities and is on scientific and government boards and panels, also a member of a number of professional societies. Sir's so research and his Bakshi Sustainable Engineering Research Groups revolves around the developing systematic methods and tools to transform engineering so that the results are logically viable, socially desirable, and economically feasible for the present and future generations. This is how is it quoted on the website of Sir's own research group. And I, I really love the way the work is going on over there. I went to the page and it's amazing. They have developed a framework of technological synergy, a process to panel multi-scale modeling framework, and a computational framework for analyzing and designing sustainable and circular systems. There's a lot going on over there, and so is going to be here with us to share about a lot of it. He has been involved with educational activities that led to developing and teaching an elective course on sustainable engineering, and he has been doing it for past 20 years. 
This is also resulted in the textbook, I think, on sustainable engineering. And we can already imagine the impact of immense amount of work and research he has done. For the same, he has received a number of awards and professional recognition, which include the UA ICT Distinguished Alumnus Award, Education Award 2019, Lawrence K. Cecil Award 2019, Education LCA Leadership Award 2020, and the recent Clara M. and Peter L. Scott Faculty Award for Excellence in Chemical well, um, I'm so sorry, Excellence in Engineering Education 2021, which are just a few of them on the list. We have such a vast experienced and multi-dimensional personality with us today. It is our pleasure to have you with us uh, today. And we are really blessed for the valuable time you have agreed to spend with us. Um, before moving ahead, I would again like to remind our audiences, please log in using the URL, which is in the chat box. This is a URL to the PGO website where you can put in your questions or upload questions from others. You just have to enter the passcode to enter um, into the meeting session and we will be able to interact better using it. So please. And now I think uh, a lot of you have heard a lot from me. So without wasting time, I would like to request Professor Bakshi to start with his talk. All your stuff. Okay. Yeah, thank you, um, Gargi, and thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, you know, this is a really nice opportunity, you know, to interact with, uh, uh, you know, all of you um, out there uh, at ICT uh, and beyond. You know, it's always very nice to come back, uh, so to say, even though this, re this visit is virtual, you know, that's the uh, best we can manage uh, given the current uh, pandemic that we have all been, um, you know, somehow managing with uh, for the last, uh, you know, two plus years now. So let me share my screen uh, and uh, <clears throat> which I hope you can see. Yes, yes. yes. Right. Okay. Uh, and you're able to hear me okay? Uh, the volume all right? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. So what I thought I should do, uh, you know, uh, for this sort of a unique um, group, uh, you know, is to not just give you kind of a technical talk. I mean, I've given lots of technical talks, uh, um, you know, uh, and so on, but I thought I would give you a little bit more of a personalized uh, presentation uh, and really talk about, you know, uh, how I have, uh, it is my own journey, uh, which I don't think is terribly unique and probably not even particularly interesting, uh, but I thought, you know, if I, if I talk about that, you know, maybe it will uh, uh, give you, especially the younger people in the group, you know, some insight and some uh, way of, uh, you know, potentially leading, you know, your own uh, lives uh, uh, as the future unfolds. Um, so I'm going to spend about, you know, spend a little bit of time uh, giving you some insight about my own journey, you know, from ICT, in fact, even before uh, ICT, or as UDCT, uh, it was called earlier, uh, to uh, the present and then give you some information related to the research uh, that I'm doing. And you will see that there is a very nice uh, you know, continuum that exists uh, between you know, this pretty long period of time that I'm going to be covering over here, roughly 50 years. So December 3rd, 1984, uh, you know, I don't think uh, all of the students uh, in the group uh, were even born at that time, uh, but that was the day I remember very well. I was a student at ICT. Um, you know, in my third year, and uh, that was the day of the uh, methyl isocyanate leak um, at the Union Carbide uh, factory in Bhopal, uh, India. These are some of the headlines, uh, you know, related to that from that day and the, the following day. Basically, about three to four thousand people died, uh, you know, uh, relatively quickly, and then tens of thousands uh, or more even have suffered uh, since then. So I remember standing, you know, uh, outside uh, one of the lecture halls uh, on the, uh, you know, in fact, near the old auditorium uh, on this cold, uh, uh, by Bombay standards, uh, you know, December morning and uh, looking at the banyan tree and the badminton court and thinking, you know, this is pretty amazing, you know, one industry causing this kind of a, of a damage. And the thoughts that were going through my mind, you know, were, were very um, uh, mixed, so to say. But one question that came up, which was almost an existential crisis, as far as I'm concerned, is, you know, am I studying, you know, chemical engineering to contribute to an industry that causes such harm? And that kind of, you know, was pulling me down, pulling me kind of at the, at the heart, so to say. 
but it wasn't just this bhopal disaster that got me thinking about these kinds of things if we go back to the time before i joined um, ict you know i grew up in kopoli which is a uh, you know some of you may may know uh, kopoli it's about 100 kilometers east of uh, mumbai uh, there was uh, you know the old uh, bombay pune road uh, goes through kopoli and uh, you know so it is just before uh the sayadri ghat start so i spent you know my uh, entire childhood over there you know i was uh, uh you know two years old when i uh, when my parents moved to kopoli and i was i uh, you know lived there until uh um, finishing 12th grade and moving to mumbai at icd and if you have been to that area probably know that kopoli is really beautiful i mean it's scenic you know natural beauty is just amazing this is a photograph Uh, taken in the monsoon, and this actually was the view from my school. Okay, so this was really nice. You can see these waterfalls over here. This little stream, you know, we used to go play in this, and uh, you know, get into all kinds of trouble every once in a while. Uh, you know, but this was literally, you know, my backyard uh, growing up. Um, you know, so so it was like, I mean, it was an amazing childhood. It was almost like living in in paradise. At least that's what I felt uh, at at that time. Or I feel it even more now. um you know given the benefit of time growing up in those kinds of surroundings i i you know ended up with this intense love for nature for ecosystems and the, the thing i remember is seeing this bird which is a golden oriole uh, around 1976 i don't remember exactly when but i remember somehow noticing this from my uh, you know from our house uh, in kopoli and we had a pair of binoculars i'm not sure why we had it but we had one and i managed to look at it through a pair of binoculars and i was just amazed at how beautiful it was and you know that just hooked me completely to uh, birds and nature and ecosystems and so on so i spent every available minute you know of my time you know uh, uh, walking around in my you know so called backyard and trying to identify as many species as i could and you know looking at plants and insects and snakes and so on i mean it was you know a really good place uh, to be uh, growing up but there was trouble in paradise so to say uh these are some old photographs that i had taken probably uh, you know 40 years ago now maybe more than 40 years ago and uh, the, the, this photograph uh, you know you can see it's an old black and white photograph this is pretty much for the view from our balcony and you can see there is this river over here the padaranga river okay which is obviously very much still there there are some palm trees that you see in the back over here um and here is another photograph looking in the other direction you know where, where we lived was just behind these bamboo trees over here to the left and again same river over here um the river you know you could it was clearly quite polluted i mean there were fish in it uh, and there were birds too you know that would feed on the fish but you could smell chemicals um, and other you know sewage and those kinds of things in the river almost regularly on weekends when the tata hydroelectric power plant which basically would control the flow of the river on weekends when they were they were not allowing a lot of water to flow you could see the fish were gasping for air okay so you know i was growing up watching all of these things and uh, you know um, i mean uh, here is another another photograph that kind of uh, you know that that i that i uh, took uh, um, at that time which shows kind of the dilemma of you know uh, development you know these electrical uh, pylons on one uh, on two sides and this uh, lone tree uh, in the middle you know to in my mind uh, as a 12 year old 15 year old you know i was like why are people destroying the things that i love you know um, i the thing i loved the most at that time uh, you know was uh, nature and birds and 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 so on and uh, you know this pollution and industry was destroying it obviously that was a childish naive way of thinking but that really left a very strong impression of all me that has lasted uh, at least until until now you know the picture uh, taken you know uh, around that time uh, and uh, you know the, I, you know this is a not a very good photograph uh, but it shows you know here are the mountains that we could see from our house and uh, these lights over here are the tata hydroelectric uh, uh, pipeline and then some of the other lights are related to traffic and the other thing that they would do on these mountains is every summer uh, they would uh, burn uh, the the uh, grass on the on the mountain so the whole all the mountains would go up in flame 
And that really bothered me to no end because it was like, you know, I mean, that would not allow the trees to grow and that which means that, you know, it would be ecologically very disruptive. You know, as a 12, 13 year old, I would tell my father, you know, why don't we just purchase all of this? And I was obviously naive. He would, he would you know, smile at me kindly and say, yeah, sure. Um, and as I grew, you know, grew older, he would say, well, you know, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, even if we had the money, which we don't, what would we do with it? How would, he, how would we take care of it? How would we manage it? How would we prevent encroachment, etc.? So anyway, those were just childish uh, thoughts. 1982, um, you know, I, I, I finished my schooling and I was trying to decide what I'm going to do uh, after 12th grade. And, you know, because of this love for nature, I was thinking maybe I should go into botany, you know, do a BSc in, 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 in biology, you know, learn botany. Then I thought maybe I should do forestry. Then I can work on, you know, forest conservation and things like that. But I did too well in 12th grade. Uh, sometimes I think for my own good. Okay. And, you know, there was social pressure also, uh, admittedly. My parents never really insisted that I should do, you know, a certain uh, profession or study something, one thing versus the other. They gave me complete freedom. But I still felt like if I did so well in 12th grade, you know, I had to go to medicine, engineering, right? Those were the hot areas at that time. I had admission in, you know, IIT and, you know, medical and UDCT also, and so on. And eventually I ended up, you know, you know, I went to UDCT, ICT as it is uh, now called, and had you know, an amazing time over there. Wonderful teachers, learned a lot. You know, uh, you know, professors uh, Sharma, J.B. Joshi, you know, uh, uh, Tiwari, Chandalia, you know, many others were there. Professor Pandit wasn't there at that time. Uh, but professors Geiger and Lali were just starting out and Bhagwat were, were students at that time, you know, finishing uh, their PhDs. So it was an amazing experience, you know, really good place. I don't need to tell any of you this. 86, I, uh, I finished my, uh, my uh, you know, BCAM, BCAM Inch. And, uh, you know, again, I ended up doing, uh, you know, reasonably well uh, at ICT. And I, I decided that I was going to go do my PhD at MIT. And I had these uh, dreams of addressing problems that were at the interface of engineering and the environment. I thought, you know, MIT is supposed to be one of the best institutions in the world. They have a very large chemical engineering department, you know, 40 faculty. I will find somebody that I can do research with uh, of the type that can address these problems at the interface of engineering and the environment. And I had these this visions of working, you know, eventually in the future with the United Nations and solving these global environmental problems. So I was obviously still pretty naive and just dreaming. What happened is that I realized after going to MIT that no one was doing the kind of research that I was really interested in doing, at least not in chemical engineering. And that resulted in kind of the same existential crisis that I felt you know, on the day and in the period after the Bhopal disaster is, you know, again, same question. Am I studying to just contribute to more pollution and, and environmental degradation? And it also get to, got to the point where I didn't really feel like doing my PhD. You know, I was really, um, you know, uh, troubled by uh, the direction in which uh, things were going, at least as far as my own life was concerned at that point. And I thought I should leave MIT, leave the PhD program. And I thought, you know, maybe I can transfer to a public policy program, uh, you know, and I, I actually spent time taking courses and talking with lots of people. Essentially, I did everything other than what I was supposed to be doing, you know, which was research. Okay, I, 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 I mean, I did reasonably well in my courses, but I did not pay attention to my research for about two years. And that resulted in a very strict letter from the department head at MIT, warning me that if I don't get my act together, they're going to stop my funding, okay? And they're basically they're going to throw me out. This was about uh, 1988, so about two years after I joined. Uh, my advisor, uh, you know, Professor George Stephanopoulos at that time also basically warned me that uh, I just wasn't, you know, putting in enough effort into this. And that woke me up. And, uh, you know, uh, I decided that, you know, I, I don't have the guts to, to leave and go and do something totally different. So I'm going to stay and do the best that I can. Uh, after wasting two years, I changed projects and based on a, on a newspaper article, 
that was published in the science section of the New York Times, I discovered or learned about this new mathematics of wavelet analysis that was being developed at that time. And I, I you know, I, I, I started thinking that that mathematics can actually be very useful for solving a problem that uh, one of my more senior students was working on, which was on extracting trends from data. Okay, and then using those trends for detecting faults and diagnosing abnormalities uh, and fixing them in chemical uh, processes. So, you know, that New York Times article basically changed my life, you know. Uh, two years I did, uh, I did not do so much. I did no research, in fact, for two years. Uh, in uh, March of uh, 1988, I switched my research projects um, and started working on wavelets and multi-scale analysis. And using the end, things worked out very well. Okay, within three years, it was enough work, you know, to, to get a PhD um, and, and uh, even though I, I basically goofed off uh, for the first uh, two years. So 1993, I moved to the Ohio State University, got a tenure track position over here. I did work, uh, you know, for um, uh, uh, one year uh, in, a, in a local company in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. But, you know, this whole thing about changing my research area and moving into the environmental direction was very much still there in my mind. I still did not have the courage to do that, you know, because tenure would have been probably difficult if I went off into a direction that nobody else was working on. But the internet came about in 1993, okay? Online journals started becoming available, you know, in pretty much every field. So I started reading ecology journals at that point, thinking that, you know, maybe I will discover some way of, you know, connecting with ecology and, and environmental and sustainability things. And eventually I did find that thermodynamics can provide a link between engineering and ecology. There are methods developed by ecologists and uh, they were completely based on the first and second laws of thermodynamics. And obviously as engineers, right, chemical engineers, we, we use the first and second law of thermodynamics. So that connection was a huge eye opener uh, for me. Um, I received tenure in 1999 and I submitted a research proposal on sustainability based on this idea about using thermodynamics to link uh, systems ecology with uh, process systems engineering. And to my utter amazement, that proposal did get funded. You know, as you may know or you may not know, in the U.S. Uh, academic system, you know, funding is really important. Without money, you can't do anything. You can't get students. You can't do research. You can do almost nothing. And getting funding is not easy. You know, it's a lot of effort, extremely competitive, particularly from federal agencies like the National Science Foundation. You know, it's a, it's a constant struggle, you know, to get uh, funding. And no matter how senior one becomes, it doesn't make it any easier. Okay, I can tell that, you know, from experience now. So after I started getting, you know, I, I got that funded. So roughly 2000 is when I finally started doing the research that I actually wanted to do for my PhD. Okay, so it took, um, you know, many years of patience and perseverance and just sort of muddling through things, you know, to get to the point where I finally was able to you know, uh, start trying to understand the reason why people would burn the forest uh, and, uh, you know, uh, not protect uh, the birds and the, and the e uh, ecosystems that I really loved, uh, you know, uh, when I was growing up uh, in, in Kopoli. So it seems like that's great, right? Well, it turns out that, you know, as soon as I started working in the area, I started thinking, you know, switching my research area, maybe was it a mistake? Because the reception from the chemical engineering community, mainly the senior faculty members, was quite unexpected. I was told things like, you know, you're working in the environmental area, but it's a passing fad. You know, nanotechnology, which was hot at that time, is going to solve all problems. There won't be any pollution. Don't waste your time working on environmental things. Uh, one comment I got, uh, you know, which I remember distinctly from a very, very famous uh, chemist was, you should not do such work. You are hindering the progress of science, okay, which was identifying, you know, environmental problems with, uh, you know, many of the chemical processes and manufacturing and the products that, that, uh, that we make. You know, it was like, you should, you, know, you should not be doing such work and identifying these negative aspects of uh, chemical engineering or chemistry because that is just hindering the progress of science. 
Other comments were, you know, you're not doing engineering anymore. It's mostly environmental science. And these really kind of, you know, were, were not good comments. And it, it, it did bother me, to say the least. I did have a few supporters, okay, uh, professionally. Uh, parents, of course, were always supportive and family and all that was obviously, you know, always there. Uh, but even professionally, one in particular was Dr. Joseph Fixell, who used to be at Battelle uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and then he actually moved uh, to OSU and we collaborated for, uh, you know, some 20 years after that and we continued to, co to collaborate. He was one of the few, uh, you know, real supporters because he was actually working in the sustainability area. He was way ahead of his time, uh, needless to say. But I was big headed, despite those negative sorts of, you know, uh, um, and well meaning. Uh, advice, you know, from people I very much uh, respect and admire, even today, you know, I was unwilling to listen to them. Okay, I felt like an out outcast, you know, nonetheless, within chemical engineering itself, and I started interacting more with industrial ecology, okay, which was an emerging field at that time. And I even stopped publishing in chemical engineering journals or, or minimized my publications in chemical engineering journals uh, for about 10 years, because I felt like chemical engineers were not getting it. Okay, so I have, you know, several of the papers that I published at that time, you know, this, this one is from AICHE journal, a perspective article. Uh, this one is in computers and chemical engineering, but all the other papers that I published in those 10 years, roughly, were in other journals. You know, this one is in ecological modeling, these two are in environmental science and technology and so on. However, again, fortunately, the money kept on coming. I was able to write proposals and I was able to get them funded. And students were always interested in working on these kinds of problems. So that got kept me going. I have to admit, a lot of the students I got were really smart students from ICT. Um, you know, uh, and uh, you will see some of the names of the current students in the next uh, several slides. Uh, you know, but Nandan Ukirwe was one of the students that joined my group uh, in, uh, I believe, 2004 or so, uh, and, and did really good work, you know, that, that you know, really pushed uh, the frontiers of, of, uh, of this whole um, area. So today, coming to the present, now, you know, the same people, you know, who were sort of suggesting maybe I should not go in this area, they have used the word visionary, which I think is overblown for me. Uh, what happened is 2012 onwards, chemical engineers started focusing on sustainability. Okay, papers started coming out, you know, more and more, where people were starting to incorporate sustainability considerations, you know, in engineering design and decision making and so on. So I, you know, uh, actually I was in, in India for a few years at that time, including at ICT um, for a couple of years. Uh, came back to the US in 2012 and went back to publishing in chemical engineering journals while maintaining a foot in industrial ecology. Published a couple of books that were mentioned earlier, you know, which also helped. And then, you know, people started recognizing the work and so on. So, you know, that's great, right? Uh, well, however, the problem that motivated me to go in this whole direction is not yet solved. Ecological degradation continues unabated. Global greenhouse gas emissions have not uh, even stabilized. So there is a lot to do. Okay. Uh, you know, yes, people are starting to work on it. You know, virtually every company today has uh, a, a, a pledge towards reaching, say, carbon neutrality. Even ExxonMobil uh, made that pledge uh, by, you know, about two weeks ago, where they have, uh, you know, promised to become carbon neutral by 2050. <clears throat> So the question is, you know, what can engineers do in addressing these kinds of, uh, you know, major challenges uh, that, that we are facing? Um, you know, and obviously what can chemical engineers do uh, in particular, but broadly any engineering or, or anybody for that matter. This problem is an area where everybody can contribute and needs to contribute. But before I go any further, let me just pause over here. You know, um, uh, I've been talking a lot, so let me just pause over here and see if uh, there are any clarification questions, any anything that that uh, anybody has wants to bring up. I'm happy to, uh, you know, uh, answer some of those things. If there are longer, more discussion-oriented questions, it may be better to keep them, um, you know, until a little bit uh, later after I'm done with with uh, you know the rest of the uh, material also. But any any um, questions at this point? Okay. Continue, Bavik. Yeah, all right. Yeah, so then let, let me just continue then. <laughs> uh, 
So, um, you know, uh, so, so switching more towards the work that I've been doing, the research that I've been doing, you know, now that you have this, this extended background about how I got, you know, uh, where I am now, um, you know, so ecological degradation, as I said, is continuing unabated. And this cartoon over here conveys the dilemma, okay? Uh, ecological degradation is essentially, in most cases, the unintended side effect of our effort for improving our own well-being, okay? Improving our own well-being, though, is being done by destroying the very foundation of our well-being. And that's what makes our activities unsustainable. Right, we are, you know, uh, you know, uh, and I remember in school uh, reading this story uh, about, uh, you know, in, in Hindi about uh, Sheikh Chilli, where Sheikh Chilli, you know, was this uh, person and he, he wasn't uh, supposedly very smart. And there is a story where he was sitting on the branch that he was cutting. Okay, and when he cuts the branch, he himself falls off the tree. You know, that's the kind of situation humanity is actually finding itself in. You know, so this diagram over here uh, has become quite popular, at least in the sustainability community. It is a diagram that shows various what are called planetary boundaries. This, uh, you know, so these are uh, things like climate change, uh, you know, various kinds of novel uh, products, uh, such as, you know, plastics and, uh, and other uh, chemicals, mostly ozone depletion, uh, aerosols in the environment, acidification of the oceans, nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, freshwater use, land system change and biosphere integrity, uh, things like species extinction and so on. The, this uh, blue uh, or the green region rather over here, you know, this region is considered to be the safe operating space for humanity. If human activities are within that, then, you know, things are fine, don't need to worry, okay? However, you can see that species loss, extinction is way outside of the safe op operating zone. Uh, disruption of the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles are also in the danger zone, which is red. Climate change is also moving towards this danger zone, although it is not as bad as per this study uh, as um, a species loss or biodiversity loss and disruption of the biogeo uh, chemical cycles. So these kinds of studies are basically, and there are so many studies of, you know, of this type out there by now, they are, they are really showing the urgency uh, of addressing these problems and the danger, you know, that humanity faces. You know, overall nature, you know, ecosystems provide uh, about $125 trillion worth of services per year, which is triple of the global uh, gross domestic product. So all the economic activity in the world combined, nature is providing three times value as compared to that. 50% of that value is, uh, you know, uh, is at moderate or severe risk due to the loss of uh, ecosystem services, due to ecological degradation. Climate change, you know, is already costing us more than $300 billion every year, okay? Companies are realizing, you know, that there are uh, physical, uh, reputational, regulatory, and market risks due to ecological degradation. So that is why they are all now starting to really, you know, uh, at least make a lot of noises about addressing these challenges. And many companies are actually serious and are trying to truly, you know, address these kinds of challenges. From a sustainability point of view, it's important to realize that the only system that we know that has sustained itself for a very long time is nature, you know, our ecosystems. So the dilemma that is facing humanity, you know, is sort of summarized here, is that the relationship between human and natural systems, at least for the last 300 years, since the Industrial Revolution, it has been antagonistic. It's net negative. Okay, as I show in this diagram, you know, we rely on the biosphere and it helps us in improving our own well-being. But by improving our own well-being, we degrade the biosphere. That's why there is a negative sign in this direction. Okay, that is inherently unsustainable. So the challenge that we face is how do you make the human nature relationship net positive or synergistic where we rely on the biosphere for improving our well-being and in return, we improve the well-being of the biosphere also. How do we you know, establish that type of a relationship? Okay, That's, that is the big dilemma that is facing all of humanity uh, today, you know, be it uh, individuals, consumers, industry, governments, uh, you, know, you name it. 
The response from engineering typically they has tended to be new technologies and more efficient. Okay, and there is a lot of progress uh, in these areas. You know, amazing uh, results, and I'm sure engineering will be able to develop. You know, uh, and meet the challenges uh, that we face through technologies and improving efficiency. You know, but is that going to lead to sustainability? Is this focus on improving efficiency is that really all that is needed? To answer this question, let's just look at the history of technology for a minute. And the history of technology consists of intended and unintended uh, effects. For example, in the early 1900s, the horseless buggy, which we call a car now, uh, was uh, uh, developed. The intended benefit in New York City, at least, was to eliminate horse manure from the streets. The unintended harm that cars have caused are things like smog and climate change. Artificial fertilizers, the intended benefit was to enhance food production. Unintended harm are harmful algal blooms due to excess nitrogen and phosphorus that runs into uh, the local bodies of water across the world. And we could go on, okay? Fossil fuels gave us cheap and plentiful energy, but it also resulted in climate change. Okay, neonicotinoid uh, pesticides, you know, are very good at controlling pests, but they are major contributors to the decline of insects, you know, butterflies, uh, uh, grasshoppers, crickets, uh, and so on. Is it possible that the solar and wind uh, technologies that we are developing and, and adopting today, where the intended benefit is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, in the future may cause unintended harm due to the mining and the, and the high dependence on exotic materials uh, due to the production of waste, uh, you know, because these uh, solar panels and wind turbines currently, at least, there is no technology for uh, and, and policy for recycling um, and reusing uh, these products. You know, is it going to result in uh, mountains of electronic uh, waste in the future? What about the effect on land use because of large installations of solar and wind um, energy? You know, uh, is it going to affect the local weather? Uh, you know, is it going to change the local weather patterns because of these large scale installations? We don't know the answer to these questions yet, but you know, historically at least, technology has had lots of benefits, but it has also routinely created unintended harm. That is something that we need to figure out how to avoid, or at least to minimize the chance of that kind of unintended harm, because the question we need to answer is, will today's sustainable technologies also cause unintended harm? As engineers, I think we have the responsibility to make sure that that unintended harm does not happen, or at least the probability of it happening is minimized. So environmental problems are really complex, okay? They tend to shift in space, in time, between different types of flows, and across disciplines. So let me give you a quick example of that. You know, I told you about, about uh, you know, uh, cars. They got introduced, they replaced the horse-drawn buggies. Uh, you know, pollution problems shifted, you know, from just being a local problem in New York City to smog being a regional problem, climate change being a global problem. Also, they tend to shift in time. Climate change, you know, is going to uh, you know, occupy us for centuries, okay? The manure that it replaced, you know, would go away in maybe a week. Okay, it would just biodegrade. Problems tend to shift between flows. We may save energy, you know, we may have technologies for reducing energy use, but it may require more water. Okay. Shifting between disciplines also happens. You know, many times a lot of more efficient technologies, like say light bulbs, um, are certainly a great idea. I'm not at all suggesting that efficiency is a bad thing, uh, you know, in this regard. But the thing that engineers don't realize many times is that increasing efficiency oftentimes encourages consumption. Okay, in Mumbai, there is this coastal highway that is being built, for example. I'm just giving you one example. You're a lot of new roads, metro, etc. Roads in particular, historically, it has been shown that you build better roads that encourages more people to buy cars and more people to drive and potentially, you know, creates all of the negative effects of, of uh, you know, personalized uh, transportation. More efficient light bulbs have been shown to encourage more consumption of light and more emissions due to the corresponding energy use. So in these cases, the problem is shifting from engineering to behavior and economics. Efficiency typically makes technology cheaper. Economics tells us that if something becomes less expensive, consumption goes up. 
Okay, so this is a this is a connection that most engineers don't really realize uh, or ignore. In addition, sustainability requires respecting nature's capacity, and it also requires our activities to be socially just. <clears throat> Existing disciplines, you know, most of them at least today, are not in a position to solve these kinds of problems. Traditional chemical engineering cannot solve these kinds of problems. Traditional economics cannot solve these kinds of problems, and that is why this new discipline has been emerging. What is being called, you know, sustainable um, engineering. So, as far as sustainability is concerned, you know, the basic requirements uh, are, you know, just listed over here. You know, sustainable activity or product. You know, this is I'm looking at this more from the engineering point of view. A sustainable activity or product must be ecologically viable. You know, it has to respect nature's caring capacity. It has to be socially desirable. You know, people will, you know, want to use that product. Okay. Uh, and it has to be economically feasible. You know, it has to be profitable to the company. <clears throat> if you uh, think about, you know, ecosystem, society, and, and the economy, the relationship is shown in this diagram over here. The environment or ecosystems provide the foundation for everything. Society relies on nature for its activities, and the economy relies on society and the environment for its activities. So from a sustainability point of view, ecosystems or the environment provides the foundation for human well-being and for sustaining it. So respecting nature's capacity is critical. If, if ecosystems are degraded, society cannot function, economy also cannot function. As I mentioned earlier, you know, nature is known to be sustainable. So eco-mimicry, learning from ecosystems and mimicking them, you know, seems like a good strategy. Okay, so, you know, let, let, let me now talk about some of the specific things that we are doing, you know, motivated by this background that I have uh, provided, some of the specific things that we are doing in our research. So the overall goal of the work that we are doing, you know, is to develop an engineering that makes positive contributions to sustainable development. More specifically, you know, uh, what we are uh, focusing on is to develop an engineering that can enable a net zero nature positive and socially equitable world. Net zero meaning that the impact of engineering activities should be zero, negative impact should be zero. Okay, uh, you know, in other words, uh, you know, we may should make uh, products that have no net emission of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases, should have no net consumption of water or withdrawal of water from the environment and so on no net emission of plastics into the oceans and so on. They should be nature positive, okay? Nature has been degraded tremendously over the last many decades, okay? Uh, you know, and I'm not, not just talking of Kopoli, where I, you know, I, I watched it being degraded. I watched the forests being burned, basically, as, as I was growing up. But that has happened across the world and continues to happen. It is high time that we do our engineering activities or human activities more broadly in a manner that we don't cause any degradation of nature anymore. In fact, we uh, our activities should, should result in a restoration of ecosystems. Okay, social equity is extremely important. You know, this is uh, an issue where you know uh, what has been happening is that you know the 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 more well off, the rich, um, you know, benefit from technology and all the other economic growth and so on, and the poor, poorer are left to bear the consequences of those side effects. Okay, and this applies at individual levels, it applies at the level of countries also. The United States, for example, you know, has emitted um, roughly 30% of the greenhouse gases that are responsible for um, you know, uh, climate change, uh, with 5% of the world's population. And the impact of that is being felt, you know, across the world. So from an equity point of view, the US and Western Europe, which collectively is about 50 to 55% of global uh, emissions, uh, historically, they have a greater share of the responsibility, they should take, you know, be responsible for a greater part of addressing this challenge. So that also has to be addressed. The approach that we are adopting is very much based on my love for nature. Okay, uh, you know, uh, the idea is to learn from and emulate uh, ecosystems. And what we're trying to do is develop methods and tools to prevent unintended harm and to guide, you know, our decisions, okay, as engineers here. 
We're working on several projects. I'm not going to talk about all of these, uh, you know, but I'm just going to give you a very quick uh, uh, introduction to the projects that, that we are working on right now. Uh, in the area related to uh, eco-mimicry or, or accounting for ecosystems, we are we have developed ways where we can we actually include ecosystems in engineering, uh, chemical engineering uh, process design and manufacturing. Uh, uh, we treat ecosystems just like unit operations. Okay, so you know uh, we treat uh, trees and uh, wetlands and soil just like a reactor or a distillation column or a pump. Okay, or a heat exchanger, and we try to design our process as a synergistic techno-ecological manufacturing process. Okay, the idea being that we explicitly account for the contribution that nature plays in supporting uh, the manufacturing process, and we respect its capacity. We're also working on including ecosystem services in life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment has become a very popular method for assessing uh, sustainability and, and guiding decisions, but it has also traditionally ignored the contribution from ecosystems. So we're developing methods and 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 uh, data, you know, uh, for uh, uh, overcoming uh, that shortcoming. Some uh, more recent work that we are doing is ways of incorporating social justice in engineering decisions. And this may seem like a strange project for an engineer, but the approach that we are taking for accounting for social justice is very much based on um uh, uh physical quantification and material and energy balances so it's very much of an engineering way of quantifying social justice okay uh, i'm not going to have time to get into that right now because we don't have enough results that i'm you know that we can disseminate at, at this point but i can answer questions later on um, if you have about this or any other topic we're also working on the circular economy of plastics decarbonization of the chemical and materials industry. How do we make the chemical and materials industry net zero from a greenhouse gas point of view? And we uh, have, de we have uh, developed uh, methods and, and tools to enable our university campus to become a net uh, zero uh, from a carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases uh, uh, point of view you know, by 2050. So the campus also has a goal to become net zero carbon by 2050. We have developed uh, methods by which you can identify, you know, what should we do? Should we, you know, uh, 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 make our uh, heating systems, cooling systems, light bulbs more efficient? Should we uh, encourage uh, certain kinds of um, commuting methods? Should we restrict the amount that faculty fly uh, to conferences and so on? Although, we have, you know, very little of that has been happening in the pandemic. So how do we, you know, decide the best way, the best strategy towards becoming uh, net zero uh, carbon. So those are some of the projects that, that we are working on uh, at, uh, at the present time. In the next, uh, you know, roughly 10, 15 minutes, what I want to do is just give you a glimpse of, uh, you know, some of the work uh, that, that we are doing, okay? So one area we're working on is in including engineering uh, and ecosystems, you know, and looking at uh, developing synergies between them. So nature provides all the goods and services, even for industrial activities. So trees, for example, obviously take up carbon dioxide, uh, but they also take up other pollutants. So for a nitrogen oxides, the filtered particulate matter, you know, they basically clean the air. They provide oxygen, they provide biomass. Uh, they also provide many other benefits to society, such as, you know, maintaining the groundwater level, forming soil, providing recreational opportunities and so on. Wetlands, similarly, you know, also uh, can clean up water. Uh, even industrially polluted water, sewage um, also, provide fresh water and many other uh, services like regulating floods, providing food, and of course, aesthetic uh, value. So a framework that we have been developing, what we are calling as techno-ecological synergy, and we will convey, you know, demonstrate or, or rather uh, uh, describe that through this diagram over here, and then give you examples in the next few slides. So we have technological systems, you know, that take raw materials, uh, make products, and produce wastes. A um, lot of efforts to reducing the, the pollution and the impact of the pollution, uh, you know, is being done through ideas such as circular economy, uh, industrial symbiosis, byproduct synergy. These are some of the techniques that are out there. When the idea is that you know the pollutants, you bring them back, keep them in the system. Okay, uh, you know, waste uh, should uh, be used as a resource. 
and products also you make sure that you don't allow products to just leak into the environment you know like uh, uh, you see plastic bottles and plastic bags and so on littering the environment ending up in the ocean and so on uh, we don't want to do that we have to establish a circular economy so that the products stay within the technological system so this kind of work there's a lot of it going on what we are doing is we are explicitly accounting for nature okay and its role in uh, in, in uh, enabling a sustainable uh, system <clears throat> so we account for ecosystems by considering their capacity to take up waste and provide natural resources just as i showed you in the you know on the previous slide about trees taking up carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide and so on okay and wetlands you know taking up dirty water and providing you know clean water and and so on so the idea is to have this synergistic techno ecological network that we want to establish eventually that network should become self sustaining we hope okay where you see that net input uh, on, uh, you know from the uh, tech, uh, to the technological system you know there is nothing really coming in there are no products that are leaking into the environment there is no pollution that is happening this whole system is self sustaining now this may sound crazy but this is on nature functions we already know we already have this amazing system called ecological systems ecosystems that has been doing exactly this you know um, over the last you know many many millennia so maybe if we learn from nature and can emulate it in other human systems maybe we can also achieve this what seems currently like a utopian goal so some examples of you know whether this is possible and what are the uh, you know potential benefits of this This is one of the early examples we did where we considered a biodiesel manufacturing process that is uh, next to the Ohio River, uh, you know, outside of Cincinnati. And uh, you know, there was a power plant, a combined heat and power plant, burning coal here for meeting the electricity needs. We looked at you know putting a wetland in this part of their land and treating the water and see if we can make this plant uh, you know uh, net zero water. And we thought you know what if there were uh, trees that were growing in the green region you know how much of the air pollution would those trees be able to take so effectively we introduced you know the wetland and the forest as unit operations in the biodiesel manufacturing flow sheet so you, on the left hand side you see this is the standard you know flow sheet for making biodiesel from soybean oil and we are now also including these uh, ecosystems as as unit operations the results we got are summarized on this slide and i'm not going to uh, explain the right hand side the graph in any kind of detail all i'm going to tell you is that you know what we found is that the techno ecological synergy if we include ecosystems in the design and do an integrated design we could come up with a design that reduced water use by uh, by 94% okay without any compromise on making money okay so we did need a little bit more land we did take the cost of that land into account but if we were to design an integrated system and optimize it you know with the uh, you know adjusting the the manufacturing process according to the capacity of the wetland to treat water and vice versa we could come up with a design where instead of 5.4 million liters of water for the conventional design you only needed 0.3 million liters of water for this integrated techno ecologically synergistic design if you include vegetation along with wetlands you can even get other benefits and i'm not going to get into those details nature however is fickle it's intermittent okay some days the sun shines other days the sun doesn't shine some days the wind blows from one direction other days it will blow from some other direction some days it rains other days it doesn't rain technologies we don't like them to be intermittent we like you know to get our products at a consistent or you know, constant rate so how do we manage to work with nature's intermittency so the idea that we have been working on now is to rather than you know uh, doing manufacturing at a constant rate and then you know putting our pollution into the environment expecting nature will take care of it what we are doing now is exploring the possibility of doing manufacturing in a manner that is adaptive to nature's intermittency okay so if nature doesn't have a lot of capacity to take up pollution don't manufacture or manufacture less when the capacity to take up pollution is higher that's when you can increase your manufacturing does this make economic sense does this make environmental sense to answer those questions we have done one uh, case study uh, which is uh, you know for the manufacture of chlorine this is a chloroalkali process in in galveston texas 
And the pollutant that we are focusing on is ground level ozone, which is a big problem in that region. This is the Houston uh, region, basically. Okay. So here is the, the chloralkali process that is shown over here. It is using a coal-fired plant to provide electricity. It's an electrolytic process, so it takes a lot of electricity. Nitrogen oxide that is coming out from the, from the power plant, we have a conventional catalytic reduction unit for removing the nitrogen oxide before it uh, goes into the air. This is the conventional technology. And we're now also considering the possibility of planting trees to take up the pollution. Okay, and see, you know, how much benefit will that have? Uh, which we and the benefit we are quantifying using this software called BenMap from the US Environmental Protection Agency. And there is a model of trees or vegetation also that we are using. So our goal is to minimize the cost of production. And we also want to minimize cost to society. So the pollution has a health impact on society. We want to minimize the health damage to people who are subjected to the, to the pollution. We are adjusting the size of the catalytic reduction unit. We are adjusting the area of reforestation. And very importantly, we are not fixing the chlorine production rate. We are making that also adjustable. We want to you know, satisfy air quality uh, constraints. And we are also subjecting you know, our model, our, our, our design to various uh, you know, realities of uh, meteorological conditions, vegetation growth dynamics. Uh, and also the core alkali, you know, manufacturing model. To give you an idea of the intermittency, this uh, uh, diagram over here is showing how the capacity of the local trees to take up nitrogen oxide emissions varies over time. So this is for one year, and the data over here is shown on an hourly scale. And you can see it is very intermittent. Sometimes the capacity is quite large, other times the capacity is close to zero. Okay, so nature is very intermittent. Okay, also in the winter, the trees don't have many leaves, and that also reduces the capacity. Okay, to take up uh, pollution. So, you know, without getting into details again, the results that we got, what we're plotting on the y axis here is the impact on society. This is the social cost, the societal cost of the manufacturing. Um, and this is the cost to the company, this is the cost of production. Obviously, from the company's point of view, it is best to minimize cost and operate at point A. Okay, this is a minimum cost of production. It, there is a relatively high cost to society over here, but this is typically the way companies make decisions today. Okay, for point A, the result uh, we get is that, you know, the chlorine production, because we want to satisfy air quality constraints, even there, the chlorine production is indicated by the blue lines over here. It, it fluctuates quite a bit. And you see in these uh, warmer months when ground level ozone is a problem, you actually have to shut down the plant for eight days, 10 days, 11 days, five days for each of these months. Totally for 51 days, we need to shut down the plant if we want to respect air quality requirements. Annualized production cost is around uh, you know, $923,000. Health impact is about $1.4 million. This is corresponding to this point A over here. Okay, now you can put in more pollution control as is indicated over here. If you put in more pollution control, the societal impact goes down, the societal cost goes down, but the production cost goes up. Okay, so this curve is a trade off curve basically. Also, all of the points on the you know, uh, 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 you know, top part over here, this region is net negative impact, meaning the production has a negative impact on society. It is good for the company. Company makes money, but society suffers. So this is a win-lose scenario. If you want zero impact on society, this point, it costs you a lot more money with technology okay, to go to zero impact. So this is what traditional technological and engineering thinking would provide. If we now come up with a solution that includes ecosystems, we get the green curve. Notice point B over here. Okay, this has the smallest annualized cost of, produ uh, of, of production, which is actually less than the cost of production using only technology. The societal cost is also a little bit less over here. So B is immediately better than A, both from the point of view of cost to society and cost to company. Okay, which may seem very strange, but that is what nature, if we work with it, this is what it can provide. The type of production that we get for this point B is shown over here. You see, if you remember the previous uh, graph that I showed you of this type, the fluctuation production is not as much as before. 
The number of days we need to shut down the process is 38 as opposed to 51. Production cost goes to 903,000 as opposed to 923,000. And health impact cost goes down to 1.2 million as compared to 1.4 million earlier. If you plant even more trees, you can even get more benefits. You can go to zero social cost, okay? Uh, with only a little bit more uh, cost of production as compared to this point A. And you can even go to net, you know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, net positive impact uh, manufacturing, okay? Like this over here, all right? Where now these trees are taking up other companies' pollution, the pollution from cars and other pollution that may be getting emitted in the environment. And it's possible to come up with, you know, net positive impact type of manufacturing, which is good for the company and good for society. Okay, this becomes a win-win kind of solution. And this is happening by adjusting the manufacturing rate according to how nature is able to take up the pollution. So this is adaptive manufacturing, basically. So seeking synergies with, with nature can give us these net positive designs and innovative solutions. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, nature positive and society positive businesses, you know, by 2030 are expected to provide $10 trillion worth of business opportunities, 395 million jobs. Okay, so what we are, what I showed you right now, according to the World Economic Forum, is probably going to become common practice, you know, in the next 10 years. In fact, companies, forward looking businesses, uh, Dow Chemical, for example, Unilever, I know because I've worked with these companies on these kinds of topics, they're already figuring out how to develop such synergies and benefit from them. Let me now, you know, just give you a glimpse of some work that we are doing. I don't have a lot of results here, but I'm just going to give you an idea of further work that we are doing, some major challenges facing the chemical and materials industry which is that of becoming net zero from a carbon dioxide point of view, greenhouse gases. Chemical and materials industry contribute 30% to global greenhouse gases. How are we going to make those emissions to zero while being economically feasible and making sure that we don't end up shifting the problem from reducing greenhouse gas emissions to creating other kind of waste? So one thing we have done uh, in the last uh, year or a couple of years is develop, and I know this is a very complicated diagram, I don't expect you to read this and understand it, but I'm showing this to you just to show you that we have a model now that shows the flow of carbon in the global chemical industry. Okay, so you can see coal, natural gas, oil, that's where we get our carbon from mostly. Uh, all of this is carbon dioxide being emitted to the environment. These are other wastes. And these are the major categories of products that the chemical industry is making. Okay, uh, bottles, you see uh, packaging, uh, you know, consumer goods, automotive products, building and infrastructure and so on. And if you look in here, you know, there are, you, know, you see urea manufacturing over here, propane, butane, benzene, uh, you know, caprolactam manufacture, phenol, acetone, all the major sectors of the chemical industry are included here, polyethylene, vinyl chloride, etc. So the idea we are developing this kind of a model is that now we can we are starting to think, okay, what can we do to you know uh, get rid of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere? The idea is to go from a linear economy where we extract resources, make stuff, use stuff, throw it away, to a circular economy where we extract some resources, but we keep the products in the system by increasing reuse, repair, remanufacture take back of goods, uh, you know, and this obviously needs innovation. So there are plenty of challenges over here, you know, to enable this kind of circularity, but we think that circularity combined with renewable sources of energy, you know, is probably the best way of getting to net zero uh, emissions. Okay, a lot of work is needed over here. Uh, we have been working specifically on establishing a circular economy for, for plastics, in particular looking at grocery bags, and the steps we are considering over here are all the manufacturing steps for various kinds of grocery bags, you know, uh, looking at even consumer behavior, we are working with behavioral scientists over here, all the waste management, collection, sorting, uh, various recycling methods, including emerging methods that can do chemical recycling, uh, and identifying economic, environmental, uh, and circularity trade-offs. Uh, 
you know, uh, and try to figure out what is the best pathway, you know, uh, for grocery bags. What is the kind of grocery bag that we should all use? You know, if you want to enable a circular economy for plastics, how should it be manufactured? How should the waste of that grocery bag be managed and so on? And very importantly, how do we come up with new innovations to enable circularity? The result over here right now that we are finding, and I'm not going to get into the details of the results uh, in the next few slides in the interest of time, but in short, what we are finding is that there is no grocery bag available today that can enable a sustainable and circular economy. There are trade-offs. You want circularity, it's going to cost you more, and it's going to emit more carbon dioxide. Okay, So there is no good solution right now. And what we are doing is uh, going to, uh, you know, identifying what we are identifying are the areas where innovation is needed. So, you know, uh, incineration is a big uh, contributor. We need to figure out other ways. So here we're looking at chemical recycling. Uh, households, you know, how they, how people behave and the sorting happening in the, in the, in the waste treatment facilities. And this is a US centric study. Okay. There, there is also a lot of leakage that's happening from there. So those areas also are in need of tremendous amounts of additional innovation. A lot more work is needed in this direction, uh, you know, and eventually we need to apply these ways, you know, to the entire uh, chemical industry, uh, you know, and get to net zero, you know, as soon as uh, possible, but without breaking the industry, you know, but without uh, huge economic uh, disruption and so on. So let me conclude then. So you know, overall, you know, if I, I started out talking about sort of my journey from you know the Bhopal disaster to sustainable engineering, and some broad lessons, if I may take, you know, from that, is it's important to know what drives you. Okay, if you know your passion, that will really help. Okay, and then follow its lead. Life, you know, gives many chances. Okay, I mean, I, I've made mistakes. You know, uh, in my life, we all make mistakes, but life gives chances to recover from false starts and mistakes. Okay. Having the self-confidence to follow your passions is important. And honestly, I don't think I had the self-confidence to follow my passions. I did, but I did it in a manner, um, you know, I, I, I disconnected from the chemical engineering, you know, community for about 10 years, which maybe wasn't the best thing to do, but whatever, you know, I mean, it, it, it eventually things seem to work out. As far as sustainable development is concerned, you know, what engineers, engineers need to do is to contribute to this paradigm shift. Uh, towards accounting for and respecting nature. If you want to account for and respect nature, we need to know something about nature. We need to know something about ecology and ecosystems. And it turns out surveys have shown that at least in the Western world, engineers are among the least ecologically literate. Okay. Think about it. How much do you know about the local birds and trees on ICT campus? And I don't know how much you're going to the campus right now, but you know around where you live. How many other species do you know? Can you, you know, identify the common birds that are found over there besides a crow? I would have said crow and sparrow, but sparrows are not very common in Mumbai anymore. Okay, or I would say crows and pigeons, maybe, right? So we need to become more ecologically literate. Also, engineering alone is not going to solve the problem. We need to collaborate with other disciplines. All the work that we have been doing involves collaboration with ecologists, with economists, and increasingly with social scientists. What we are doing is showing that if we seek synergies with nature and mimic ecosystems, there are innovative opportunities for many win-win solutions. Okay, you know we used to do things in this way, uh, maybe of at least several centuries ago. And in, in India is an ancient civilization. We would not have lasted for so long if our activities were not sustainable. Maybe we need to learn from the way we used to do things and adapt it and adopt it to the modern ways. So let me finish up. I'm not going to go through this, but lots of students to acknowledge. You know, uh, the results I've shown you are from two very smart students I've had from ICT, Utkarsh Shah, who just graduated, working with uh, Amazon, and Vyom Thakkar, who is a current student, you know, working on his PhD. Uh, Varsha Gopalakrishnan was another student, uh, you know, whose results also I showed you. And you can see, I mean, there are, you know, students from all over the world. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate uh, to get, uh, you know, very good mentors uh, and uh, very good students. Excellent collaborators. I'm collaborating now with my own former, you know, PhD advisor, Professor George Stephanopoulos, uh, on the decarbonization work and financial support from various uh, organizations. So let me stop over there. And if there are questions, comments, anything, I'm more than happy to 
um, entertain them. Thank you for your attention. That was really amazing for the entire thing. And I must add in the eco-mimicry concept. Personally, I am very much amazed by it because it was the first time I was hearing about it. And uh, it, is, it is really uh, amazing. Also, the part uh, where you mentioned about this thing, there are a lot of sustainable technologies that uh, have been coming up in the past years. Uh, you know, undoubtedly, like, in unintended, they are doing a lot of harm. And uh, it, it, it is really a thought which is uh, in the head since the point you have mentioned it. It was really amazing to hear. It's now open to questions. And I would like our technical head to share the screen where we have asked the audiences to put in their questions, the pigeon hole uh, side, so that sir will be able to see. And so we have a lot of questions coming in from the audiences. So what we can do is, uh, due to the limitation of the time that we have, is that uh, you please read those questions and uh, take up the question that you feel most uh, approachable one or the most uh, convenient, rather than convenient, most useful one for you, according to your perspective, and then we can uh, go ahead with those questions. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, I'm waiting for the technical uh, head to share the screen. Is that possible or uh, should we go with reading out the questions? While he's doing that, uh, Bhavik, can I just... Uh ask to make some comments uh, yes. as usual it's an outstanding lecture uh, very thought provoking and i think i got some answers which i was looking out for see especially during the beginning of pandemic if you remember when yes. the manufacturing activity was practically shut down for two months or so there were lots of uh, reports saying that how air has become clean how water has started showing uh, better fish species, how uh, people from Delhi can see the, uh, the, the the peaks of Himalaya, so on and so forth. So I was just wondering if two months of stoppage of industrial activity is capable of driving <laughs> nature to this extent, how is it not possible for us to as sustain the manufacturing to take this ecological uh, impact in 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 in, uh, in account. I mean, account for that. I think you did provide that particular answer in terms of seasonal manufacturing because I'm not sure whether when you sometimes many a times you do production because you have a capacity and then you are stuck up with the storage problems, deterioration problems. I don't know whether those have been uh, taken into account when you consider that impact. If you consider right. that impact and if you do seasonal production as per the need, I'm sure uh, overall balance wise, it will do that. So, but right. if you have given me an answer is how you, one can compute the overall impact and what is the sustainable manufacturing rate, which it should be, which will have uh, a maximum, a minimum social impact and a maximum, uh, a minimum environmental degradation. Thank you, Bhavik. Great. Yeah, no, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pandit, uh, for that uh, question and, and comment. I mean, basically, you know, we haven't taken the market effects into account yet. That is something that we are working on. Yeah. Obviously, you know, uh, markets will have a demand and that will affect prices and so on. I mean, eventually, what is needed is an integ integrated way of incorporating all of these things. And to some extent, the markets will already integrate, right, in the engineering decisions that we make. It's niche that we don't integrate. Yeah, indeed. Right. So if we start integrating it, you know, I think that is something that we have the technology for doing it. Indeed. Okay. In a way, we are kind of doing it already, responding to this. So for example, in Delhi, they shut down power plants in the winter. Correct. Right. Yes. In Beijing, they shut down all industry before the Olympics. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So we are already doing it, but we should do it in a more educated manner, in a manner that is less disruptive, you know, to industry and is more beneficial to society. True. True, indeed. I fully agree with you there. Uh, one more uh, request or a permission. Uh, I mean, it's this outstanding lecture. I would like to share with uh, you, uh, have your permission to share this lecture with Indian Chemical Council industry sector. Let them sure. also think of that. And I think I'm, my request to the uh, masterclass team is do widely share this lecture with all the students of ICT. I can see about 150 students now, but I think every student of ICT should, ICT should listen to this particular lecture 
it has opened up a gamut of opportunities for uh, new entrants yeah i would be more than happy you know i mean you have all my permissions i'm happy to send you the slides if that helps and you know you, you are welcome to share the recording you know no issues with that and any additional information i'm happy to provide there's nothing proprietary over here and you know i, I only see you know benefits for everyone concerned thank you bhavi much appreciated thank you sorry please continue technical head uh, we have the questions here sir so you please mm -hmm. go through and pick up the questions that you feel uh, can be addressed yeah so so I, i will just start with the one that is the highest work so you know as i apply um uh ict and the graduate students what are the possible channels for us to participate in research uh for sustainable development which can contribute to and can open more opportunities for us um, in the us well you know there are, there are many ways for doing it i mean one uh, one way is to um and why just in the us you don't have to be in the us to be doing this you know there's plenty of uh, work uh, and opportunities you know in india in mumbai uh, you know uh, maybe even right at ict uh, or in the society maybe where you live and so on but you know i mean uh, uh, one way uh, the path that i chose uh, is the path of higher education and doing research uh, and so on so that is certainly one way a uh, lot of companies you know are hiring people who have the kind of expertise you know that uh, um is needed for the type of work that i that i was describing so things like life cycle assessment for example is a very popular technique um and uh, people are getting jobs you know due to having uh, that uh, that knowledge uh you don't even have to continue in chemical engineering if you go let's say decide you want to do an mba or go into finance lots of opportunities over there also you know in fact for finance one really interesting thing that is developing in finance is how do we encourage people you know to account for nature and to you know how do we encourage the synergies that i was talking about from the financial point of view the approach that is being explored is to develop a way where people where society pays for ecosystem services if a tree is providing a service you pay for it and if we do that you know then it creates this very interesting um, ecosystem if if i have time to use that word there you know uh, and and it encourages these kinds of synergies that i was talking about so there is a lot of work going on in what is called environmental bonds and so on in that area so i know a lot of icd students you know i mean go into all sorts of areas some will go into research some may go into management and so on you know those are things uh, where you can certainly contribute uh, even just look on campus you know look at where the impacts are you know look at uh, you know um, uh, the carbon footprint of the activities you know what are the ways by which you can increase ecological literacy you know of the students you know maybe identify the trees and birds on campus or in your surroundings you know these are all things i think you know uh, that that can be done and they are needed in my opinion indeed Okay, uh, Isha, going ahead. We can again have the view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you think harms the environment the most, and how we deal with it? Okay, good question. How what harms the environment the most? In my opinion, it is human greed. Okay, uh, you know, but then human greed is something that <laughs> seems to be unavoidable. But you know, on a more uh, constructive way, you know, what harms the environment? is the fact that we are not willing to pay the full cost of the things that we consume okay we want the benefits but the cost is being paid by others okay and i mentioned already this this is a social justice and equity issue i mentioned you know us is responsible for 30% of the emissions uh but you know other countries you know like um, uh the island nations in the world and and even many parts of india and parts in africa and so on are bearing the consequences of that so if individuals companies governments you know need to come up with uh, policies where they the full cost of the impact is actually uh included in the price okay uh you know i mean the other thing is that uh, from an engineering perspective you know the fact that we engineers have been taking nature for granted we assume it is infinite for our practical purposes right we assume nature to be an infinite source and an infinite sink that also uh, uh harms the environment how do we deal with it i think the simple thing you know uh, that can be done is you know learn about nature you know learn how nature works inculcate a love for nature 
there is a saying which become quite popular by a senegalese uh, 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 minister i think uh, where it goes something like you know um, uh, uh, what you love uh, you will protect okay so that's really the thing that that is uh, also uh, needed think about your day to day activities this is not something that has to be done only after you get a job or you know become the ceo of a company these are things that can be done right on a on a daily uh, level okay let me go back to the view go back uh, to the screen yeah okay um could please elaborate uh, on the thermodynamic link between engineering and ecology sure so the relationship between you know from a thermodynamic point of view between engineering and ecology is the fact that the currency that drives technological systems and ecological systems is energy okay what ecologists have done is they represent everything in terms of uh, uh, you know what they call embodied energy even so for example what they do is that they do all their accounting in terms of sunlight so sunlight drives everything on the planet sunlight is even uh, uh, been responsible for creating the fossil fuels although that was ancient sunshine so with solar energy you can do accounting that takes into account the work that nature does so you know uh, engineering also engineering processes also involve use of energy and transformation of energy okay so it is energy in fact not really energy it is exergy okay so exergy is the available energy it is the energy after you remove the entropy part okay from energy uh so it's basically second law of thermodynamics uh exergy is the common currency that flows between ecological systems and human systems and that is how it is possible to provide a thermodynamic link between engineering and ecology at least in brief that is what i can i can say yeah very very understandable and clear uh let's see uh Uh, I think we will go to this uh, second question. I can see because it scrolled down actually. Uh, then the okay. we are having. How do you think the point of view of engineers have changed in sustainability right. research and development from eighty three to twenty twenty? Yeah. So, so I think the change has been see traditionally industry and engineering also used to consider you know pollution control and all that to be a necessary evil. Okay, meeting regulations and all was done because you know it it had to be done. We had no choice, and otherwise the government people would kind of you know bother you and all that, right? Um, you know, so it was very much uh, considered to be a cost. You know, sustainability was a cost, not a benefit. It was a pure cost, and the minimum, the less you did of it, the better. That was the attitude. What has changed now, it seems, is industry has realized that, uh, and engineers have realized that sustainability actually. can be a way of making more money okay it is not just a cost but it is also a way of making you know of getting more revenue there are many examples of new products that have been developed purely because the company was trying to improve its sustainability and i will give you one example of that uh procter and gamble makes detergents uh, you know the the brand that they sell is called tide and uh, you know they did like uh, they, they did a life cycle assessment of their product you know about 20 years ago and they found out that the largest impact of uh, you know in the in the life cycle of their detergent was you know this was a us study the largest impact was in the heating of water because people heated water you know before washing their clothes they washed their clothes in warm water and that is where the largest impact environmental impact was coming from so they said well you know can we do something to our product that which will due to which people will not need to use hot water for washing clothes and the chemists and chemical engineers and surface scientists came up with what they call cold water tide it is the same detergent but different formulation and it is it has as much cleaning power in cold water as the other detergent had in warm water so cold water tide means that you don't need to warm the water and the environmental impact goes down and you know that that is that has become a, a good uh, success story for uh, procter and gamble so that is the attitude that engineers you know have increasingly adopted you know over the last uh, few decades and you know this technological synergy i was talking about you know dow chemical has started a new division 
of what they are calling nature based technologies okay and one of the things they are doing is exactly like the stuff that i was showing you where they are accounting for the role of trees in taking up pollution at their various manufacturing sites across the world Okay, we will continue the question after session. But to the audiences, I am extremely sorry, but we are running out of time. So maybe we will take two or three more questions. So whatever questions are left, uh, we are extremely sorry we couldn't cover them up. Uh, okay, moving ahead to the next question. Argi, what you can do later on is this: send these questions to Bhavik by email, and when yeah. he has time, he would be in a position to answer those questions. Absolutely, absolutely. We will yeah. say, uh, email those questions, and once he replies, we'll make sure that gets uh, sent to the students. Yeah. On a mail, yeah. That, that that that's an absolutely amazing uh, solution to this issue. Uh, okay, moving ahead, we will next take um, say more two three questions, which so feels we could. I, I think this one yeah. is an amazing one. How are we going to tackle the environmental problems caused by blockchain technology? <laughs> At a time yeah. when all the major technology giants are eager to step into metaverse. Yeah, this is not just environmental problems. Talking of the metaverse, there are potentially lots of social problems that are lurking into this. You know, the uh, you know, I, I don't have a Facebook account. I'm not a fan of uh, of that uh, particular uh, company at all. Uh, so my, I, I'm telling you this because my my you know response is going to be colored uh, uh, by that. Um, you know, I mean, like any technology. Right, right. There are positives and negatives. You know, it's important for us to make sure that the positives, you know, are the things that that are brought out, and, and it's important to also put enough pressure on the companies that are getting to be purely money minded. You know, uh, uh, where you know they make the money and uh, we bear the costs, kind of a situation, right? Blockchain technology, particularly, seems like you know it, it has a lot of benefits uh, and could be a, a, a complete game changer. The challenge with blockchain technology is that, you know, currently at least the way it is uh, implemented, it takes a ridiculous amount of electricity to run the vast networks of computing and computers uh, to do the calculations behind blockchain technology. So, you know, we need to figure out ways of addressing that. I'm not an expert in that area, so I can't tell you, you know, what can be done in that regard. Uh, Google is saying that they are, you know, going to be using only solar energy for all of their data centers. But solar energy also has some negative impacts. You know, it's not like it has; it is completely zero impact. Um, you know, uh, so so I think there is a lot more work that needs to be done um, in that area. Uh, the social issues coming up over here is with increasing uh, automation and the use of, you know, advanced artificial intelligence and so on. There is a fear that people are going to be losing jobs, and then the societal disruption because of that could be quite dramatic. Okay, in fact, there was a recent study that came out by a couple of uh, economists where they said that in the last ten years, in their according to their data in their study, the benefits of uh, technological innovation, in information technology in particular, they were focusing on, uh, seem to be less than the costs. So we, this is a this is a very difficult question. I don't have the answer to it. This is something that we will all have to grapple with, and we will all have to, you know, figure out, uh, you know, how to address the challenges that are arising and will most likely continue to arise because of these technologies that are emerging. I don't think we should shy away from them. We should uh, embrace them, but carefully, you know, with precaution, plenty of precaution incorporated. I think it's, it's a brief but a very crisp answer to it. The cryptocurrency issues also around almost the same thing. Uh, okay, right. then, uh, the last question that we are moving to uh, is a very uh, you know highly important question. I don't think it's on the screen, so I'll just read it out to you. Uh, what are the job prospects for sustain after sustainability engineering or PhD? Because uh, not everyone is into you know uh, dedicating their lives towards research. So are there new job prospects or what kind of job prospects are there for sustainability engineering? Yeah, so the job prospects, you know, 10 years ago, my students would have a hard time finding jobs. Okay, that's not the case anymore. And I'm talking of PhD students over here. I'll talk about, you know, non PhDs also in a minute. But, you know, just I'll give you the most recent example. So the most recent student who graduated uh, in uh, January, well, earlier this month, in fact, 4th of January, Utkarsh uh, Shah, you know, uh, alumnus of ICT, I believe he had five offers uh, from Dow Chemical, uh, Air Products, uh, Google, 
uh, uh, and Amazon. So four offers and he joined Amazon. Okay. Uh, so the job market right now is really good for people who have the sustain quantitative sustainability background okay a lot of openings uh, and i expect that is only going to uh, increase mm -hmm. uh, not just in the us but i believe in india across the world at the undergraduate level also i believe there are increasing opportunities uh, you know i mean basically sustainability you know is there in every aspect of uh, uh, industrial activities you know be, be it marketing you know be it uh, technology development, uh, you know, be it uh, process operation, uh, some knowledge about some of the techniques and uh, some of the concepts that are relevant, you know, to sustainability can help in getting jobs. Uh, so a lot of the undergraduate students over here, uh, they uh, benefit from an understanding of life cycle assessment and knowledge of some of the software for doing life cycle assessments. That's where, you know, people are getting jobs uh, after the undergraduate uh, uh, degree as well. So I think these opportunities are only, you know, I'm not closely familiar with the opportunities in India. Maybe Professor Pandit you know, is in a better position to answer that. But my impression is that the job prospects are good and they're only going to improve over time. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I would just like to tell you one thing. We recently, maybe about a year ago, carried out a survey looking at every chemical engineering subject which is taught in the syllabi and mm -hmm. how every subject can bring in the concepts of sustainability while that subject is being taught itself. Mm -hmm. So we have now made a syllabi where all the chemical engineering subjects right at an undergraduate level would be talking about sustainability specifically to that particular subject so that yeah. people start thinking in terms of designing an equipment or operating an equipment they will learn what they have learned about the sustainability during their undergraduate days and bring it into practice. So this is this is indeed being done. And I'm 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 hundred percent certain that as the industry matures and industry starts realizing that they need to operate not only for five years or 10 years, but need to operate it for 50 years, 100 years, the issues right. of sustainability indeed would be looked into very seriously. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, I, just one comment. I am also a chairman of uh, uh, Ministry of Environment, Forestry and Climate Change, uh, which gives grants to uh, various uh, industries or licensing it out. And they've got very broad guidelines. I don't know who came up with those particular guidelines in a sense that you have a, a, a new factory to do, come up. The 33% of the area of the factory should have a green cover that is trees and others. If it is declared as a critically polluted area, this 33% should be increased to 40%. And mm -hmm. I tried to ask questions in how did you arrive at this particular number irrespective of what you are manufacturing? And nobody had that answer. So I'm going to share this, your presentation also with this entire uh, team of mine, uh, which uh, assist me in uh, assessing this. Uh, and I am sure if you don't mind, I will arrange a lecture for them as well, uh, or I'll show this uh, recording to them as well. Sure. No, I'm more than happy, you know, for, for you to share it. You know, if I can help in any way, I would be, you know, delighted to do that. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So since we are short on time, uh, I will request uh, Isha to stop the screen sharing. We will take all these questions, mail it to Sir, and Sir can, according to his availability, answer them and get back to us over the mail. Uh, so, sorry to the audiences. Moving ahead, uh, I would like to now extend the word of thanks uh, to our speaker of today's masterclass, Professor Bhavik Bakshi, sir. Thanks a lot, sir, for giving us the time despite your busy schedule and enlightening us about such uh, amazing things and the amazing work that you are doing. Thank you a lot. Also, I would like to thank our Vice Chancellor, Pandit Sir, for being present with us today to support us and also for his valuable inputs in this session. Thank you so much, Sir. My pleasure. I would also like to thank TA, the Technological Association, entire Student Council, and of course, the whole core for Vortex 9.0, who have been a support and great help in planning and executing this event today. 
Last but not the least, a wholehearted thank you to all my dear friends, seniors, juniors, non-ICTNs, and everyone who have been patiently listening and been an amazing audience putting up such good questions. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, so here uh, we are approaching towards the end. Um, actually, we can call this an end because, uh, we, you know, uh, I would like to change it to a pause because good events never end. They pause until next time. So let's call this a po pause to the Vortex 9.0's first masterclass. We will be back soon with another amazing session and enlightening speaker. And um, that will be very soon. Uh, I would just like to request uh, Bakshi sir to please uh, stay back in the meeting. We are actually hoping to click one or two uh, pics so that uh, we can have them documented. So uh, yeah, and among the audiences, please, uh, if you could uh, you know, start your videos for a while, we can just take some uh, screenshots and Pandit sir too. So please, uh, if you're there in the meeting. Yeah, yeah I'm there. I'm very yeah. prepared. Yeah, so we, we can take some screenshots so that it will remain as a good memory for us about the session. So technical heads, once you are done, I'll just go ahead. Okay, so thank you everyone for participating. Thanks for the invitation. And if you want to contact me by email, you're welcome to do that. Uh, you know, and I'm happy to answer for the questions. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks a lot again. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, the technical heads are uh, have done clicking the screenshots. If so, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's let's call this a pause. And uh, to all the audiences, we have amazing masterclasses coming ahead. Also, to serve, we'll be sending you invites if you could join us uh, for any of them according okay. to your schedule. Yeah, so, sure. uh, yeah. So let's call this a pause to the event for now or the end for the first masterclass. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.